Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I'll just give you some uh, background about my role in these new cholesterol guidelines. I was one of the uh, NHLBI reviewers, and I'm listed on the uh, document. And also, I had an opportunity to review the revised ACCHA uh, document for uh, the National Lipid Association. And I'm going to give you uh, my perspective, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to be hitting the uh, highlights uh, of those uh, guidelines. These are my disclosures. I do a lot of clinical uh, research studies. We're actively involved with the PCSK9 inhibitors, one of the world's leading enrollers in statin intolerant uh, studies. And I also have involvement in the International DMC, Data and Safety Monitoring Committee, for another PCSK9 uh, inhibitor. The main purpose of these uh, guidelines were to address critical questions that were formulated by uh, Harlan Krumholtz, who brought this uh, to the Institute of Medicine to say we need to focus on the evidence, focus on the science, and move away from expert opinion. Why was this the initiative? Because there was a lot of use of agents that were not proven to reduce cardiovascular events in randomized clinical trials albeit uh, somewhat flawed trials in my opinion, and those agents were used in preference of high intensity statins or high dose statin agents. So the whole field was going in the wrong direction, or at least the uh, data in the United States was going in the wrong direction, and the Institute of Medicine, Medicine stepped in to say we need to rebalance this and focus on the uh, science. So these new guidelines are utilizing the randomized clinical trials to provide a guideline, particularly on the use of statins, to reduce the first and recurrent cardiovascular events in high, certain high-risk individuals. Unlike the previous reports, I don't consider these as you know, uh, national guidelines because they're um, you know, really addressing specific scientific questions. And that may be one of the reasons that the NIH got out of this business of guidelines and turned over these recommendations to professional societies such as the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association with other uh, organizations uh, having uh, 48 hours to buy into those uh, recommendations without uh, you know, their opinions being uh, considered. So they addressed these issues, and they also did talk about non statin agents and also focused on uh, uh, safety. Again, they have critical questions, as I uh, mentioned before, and evaluated clinical trials that were completed uh, before July 2013. So they're, you know, fairly, uh, you know, recent. Summary of the recommendations, the big picture, lifestyle is critically important. Diet, diet composition, keeping the weight down if you're you know, overweight or maintaining an ideal body weight, and a regular aerobic exercise of at least moderate intensity. There's no limit to the amount of exercise. The more you do, the longer you live, as shown in many uh, long-term uh, studies. Statins are the primary therapy uh, to reduce uh, cardiovascular events based on the randomized clinical trials, and they do have an appropriate safety of uh, uh, you know, uh, in the trials for most individuals. But you want to ask to focus on some of the limitations and some of the uh, specific drug interactions in certain, uh, you know, individuals that haven't been well studied, such as uh, individuals that we see a lot in our clinics, those with uh, HIV on protease inhibitors, where the interaction is, uh, you know, with the stands is actually quite high. So, so we want to... Um, make sure that we involve the patient in our uh, discussions. This is a partnership in order to maintain long-term uh, success. Who are these individuals that they evaluated? Individuals who already had cardiovascular disease, individuals who are at risk for cardiovascular disease based on a very high LDL cholesterol level that was greater than 190 uh, milligram per deciliter, and individuals with diabetes who have LDL cholesterol levels between 70 to 189 milligram per deciliter. Primary prevention, how do you identify these individuals? They came up with a new risk score, and you can download this from the uh, website, or you can use an app called ASCVD, so atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, and have it on your uh, iPhone or uh, similar types of uh, you know, uh, mobile uh, devices. So let's start off with individuals who have atherosclerotic vascular disease who are less than 75 years of age. We know that high-intensity statins are more effective than placebo. 
high intensity statins are more effective than low intensity statins in reducing recurrent cardiovascular events in ACS patients. We've got examples of atorvastatin versus placebo, 80 milligram versus placebo in the MIRACLE trial, atorvastatin 80 milligram versus pravastatin 40 milligram uh, daily in the PROVE-IT trial, and in people with stable disease, atorvastatin 80 milligram beat atorvastatin 10 milligram daily in the treating to new targets trial, a 10,000 person study followed individuals for five years. So the evidence supports the use of atorvastatin 80 milligram uh, daily. A biomarker study with resuvastatin showed equivalent effects on biomarkers, but it was not an event trial. So we really have one agent that's shown uh, you know, to have benefit, even though numerically uh, resuvastatin may be more effective in driving the LDL cholesterol down. In these trials, it was stated that maybe it's not the LDL cholesterol level that's achieved, but maybe it's the intensity of the statin. This was argued by Rod Hayward at the University of Michigan in a paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which really got this whole discussion going. In other words, high-intensity statins are not only more effective in reducing LDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, but they're more effective in reducing inflammation, such as CRP. They're more effective in reducing the vulnerability of the plaque, as shown in many different vascular imaging studies. All right. So again, moving away from the achieved LDL cholesterol, you know, would be perhaps a more rigorous interpretation of the clinical trials. It also was shown that individuals who had a 50% or greater reduction in LDL cholesterol derived more benefit from the statin than individuals who had a less than 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol. So those are some of the background messages that uh, you know support this 1A indication. Now, what about individuals who, um, you know, happen to be, uh, you know, uh, active liver disease, have mild chronic di uh, kidney disease, many of the statins, with the exception of atorvastatin, are renally excreted after they're metabolized in the liver? Well, you would use a lower dose because we have to be concerned about safety. We're always balancing efficacy and safety, and that's why engaging the individual in a discussion with a team is the most way that we can achieve, best way we can achieve success, you know, going forward. What about the older individuals? We see many of them, 75 years of age or older. Well, they were underrepresented in the trials. Typically, the trials included individuals up to the age of 75, um, and so not over the age of 75 as an entry criteria. But it appears that individuals that were older during the duration of the trial, 75 making it to 79 or 80, had equal efficacy with the high-dose statins. But because the drug elimination uh, pathways, the liver, the kidney, uh, is reduced in people that are older, they suggest using a little bit lower dose of high-intensity statin in individuals 75 years of age or uh, older, and therefore this gets a 2B uh, uh, recommendation is shown, uh, you know, over, uh, over here. Now, what about individuals who are, have high LDL cholesterols greater than or equal to 190 milligram per deciliter? We've got one trial, the West of Scotland trial, that looked at individuals who averaged LDL cholesterol levels of 192 milligram per deciliter. And that study reduced major cardiovascular events and tended to reduce mortality at five years, p-value 0.051. And by the time they actually collected all the data, they followed people for five and a half years, then the p-value became 0.049. So it's you know, a margin uh, close, and that's why it's uh, one trial and it's given a B uh, because it is one trial. But, you know, based on studies of individuals with lower LDL cholesterols, we don't dispute that when your LDL cholesterol is at the upper end of the distribution that you would derive benefit from statin uh, therapy. Now, what about um, other individuals, um, you know, who um, do, you, or, or those individuals, you know, who may only have a single risk factor? family history. Well, we're often dealing with genetically susceptible individuals, those who have a uh, defect in the LDL receptor or the ApoB, which is uh, ApoB100, which is, or apolipoprotein B, which is a ligand for the receptor. And we know that these individuals are at a super high risk for cardiovascular disease beginning at the age of 20 for men, 30 to 35 for women. We don't need to do a full risk you know, assessment if they have the family history of uh, premature atherosclerosis, 
um, have high LDL cholesterol levels, we can just actually put them on high intensity statins. We know the natural history over 20 years in those uh, individuals. In terms of reduction, where do we go if they're at 190 or above? At least a 50% reduction. You can't get there with uh, all the time with statins. Many individuals with very high LDL cholesterol levels have high levels of lipoprotein little a, which is a modified form of LDL particles with two ApoA proteins. It's a particularly atherogenic particle, susceptible to oxidative modification, but statins raise it. Okay? And so that may offset the reduction in the LDL cholesterol, which is uh, you know, still part of the calculation. LPA comes within that uh, density uh, range. So you may not be able to get there, and using a second agent in those individuals who have genetic disorders has been uh, advocated. What about individuals with uh, you know, diabetes? Why does it say moderate intensity statins? Because there was a study uh, called the CARDS trial with atorvastatin, uh, 10 milligram, and those individuals had about a 37% re reduction in major cardiovascular events at 3.3 years. The trial was so overwhelmingly positive that it was stopped early, before the five-year time. And then the heart protection study uh, showed that in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, that uh, simvastatin 40 milligram daily, which would be a moderate intense statin, according to this definition, also had benefits. So that's why they come up with a re recommendation of moderately intense statin. Because there's more than one trial, it gets an indication of uh, 1A. Uh, Individuals who um, um, you know, you might think uh, would uh, use high intensity statins. You know, we really just have, you know, opinion, limited subgroups. So uh, let's say in the miracle, the prove it, the TNT trial, those individuals derive more benefit uh, who had diabetes than non diabetes patients, but there weren't formal trials that actually showed this, and that's why it has a uh, 2A and then a level B uh, indication. In individuals uh, where there's uh, a lot of drug interactions, we have to be more cautious. Uh, some of those individuals benefit, but we really didn't include a lot of those individuals in the trials that have been completed and have been uh, published. With regards to um, risk equations, um, you know, the Framingham risk score is predominantly Caucasian. Uh, it's an old study uh, using the new equations, these pooling up, you know, equations from uh, different ethnic groups, more representation of women, uh, you know, in contrast to, uh, you know, predominantly, uh, uh, you know, risk calculators uh, that uh, used uh, data from men, we're able to expand the applicability of these, uh, you know, risk assessments, make them more accurate for more of the people that, uh, you know, live in the United States uh, and are represented as high-risk individuals. And again, that uh, um, calculator was uh, validated after the fact, you know, by the regards trial. Paul Munner, who used to be at Mount Sinai Medical Center, now at the University of Alabama, you know, was the lead author in that JAMA paper. So despite the controversy that it initially came uh, forward by Paul Ritker, this, uh, you know, is a reasonable uh, tool to use, and I would encourage it um, as it is more accurate and more applicable. What about individuals who, um, you know, have LDL cluster levels less than 190, they don't have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, why does it have a 2A indication? You know, because we really have, you know, a trial, uh, the AFCAPS TESCAP study, mainly men, you know, uh, about 995 women, no benefit in women as an independent group. And then we've got data from uh, the Jupiter trial, uh, which was important. Um, and those studies showed benefit, but it didn't quite address these individuals, uh, you, know, um, you know, prospectively and independently. And so it's given a lower level of indication. You know, the benefit, you know, is uh, going to be less in individuals starting with a lower LDL cholesterol level. Just for everybody to know, the uh, relationship is log uh, linear that even though everybody talks about that linear relationship, you know, from uh, the uh, uh, cholesterol treatment trialists, that's a log linear scale. So the individuals who are at the very high end of the distribution are at exceptionally high risk, and that's why that 190 milligram per deciliter cutoff value, you know, is identifying people that, uh, you know, should derive benefit from a cholesterol-lowering therapy uh, with a uh, statin. So how do we approach individuals? 
do they have uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? We, and the answer, yes or no. Um, they did not allow for a room for, let's say, coronary calcification, um, you know, uh, because that wasn't uh, used as a prospective entry criteria in any of the clinical trials. So just to tell you how rigid, how uh, formal they were in terms of the evidence that they use and the recommendations that they use. Not that any of us would dispute that if you have a, uh, you know, coronary calcium that there's some atherosclerosis there. We just don't know the severity. But it's a clinical, you know, presentation, a clinical event. We get a fasting lipid profile. We get an ALT. Um, as the chair of the National Lipid Association Stand Safety Report, we recommend a creatinine kinase. Why? Because sometimes they are drawn at later times, and if you don't know the baseline before you start, somebody may get their therapy interrupted for the improper reasons, or if somebody happens to come in and they uh, exercise for the first time in uh, several months or more intensively, and their muscles are sore, they ache, you may get a CK level, not realizing that when you do exercise, your CK level goes up and may stop the therapy for the inappropriate reason and call those individuals statin intolerant. So I do endorse getting a baseline CK level uh, individuals who are, uh, you know, starting. If you're less than 75 years of age, high intensity statins, I'll give you that table in a minute. Uh, over 75 years of age, you might think about a moderate intensity, think about the drug interactions, think about the drug elimination pathways, liver, kidney, and be a little bit more conservative uh, in those individuals. But I just want to let you know that the trial showed equal benefit in subgroups of older versus uh, the younger individuals using that cutoff. So what's a high intensity stand? I've already mentioned it somewhat. It's a Torvus stand, 80 milligram. They include 40 milligram, I think, for the older individual, but 40 milligram has never been tested in a, a randomized clinical trial. Uh, Resuvastatin, uh, 20 milligram in Jupiter. The lunar study was 20 to 40. The biomarker study in ACS uh, individuals, uh, 20 milligram was used, uh, you know, in the Jupiter trial, but that's primary prevention. But due to the lipid lowering effects or the superiority of resuvastatin in many trials, you know, it gets into the high intensity uh, range. Modern intensity th therapy, you can see there, and it does include uh, simvastatin at the uh, uh, 40 milligram doses I mentioned, pravastatin up to the 80 milligram dose, atorvastatin at uh, 10, 20 milligram, and that's the recommendation for the uh, patients with uh, type 2 uh, diabetes and then patavastatin up to uh, four milligram daily. Low intensity statin, again, when you have, uh, let's say, a lot of drug interactions, you might select from this list or intolerance to uh, high intensity or uh, moderate intensity uh, statins. Um, for primary prevention, we absolutely treat people who are LDL cholesterol levels greater than or equal to 190 for people with lower LDL cholesterol levels. This is where we calculate, you know, the risk and um, if the risk is 7.5% uh, or above, moderate high-intensity statins, as you can see, uh, you know, here. And uh, if their risk is uh, lower, um, you know, over here, uh, then we have to individualize, uh, you know, the treatment. Maybe it's somebody who had a coronary calcium scan or have some soft endpoint. Uh, not clinical atherosclerotic vascular disease, but some other manifestation. And again, the key is uh, the lifestyle, the exercise, weight maintenance, dietary composition, and uh, adherence in uh, being uh, successful. So to summarize from the first four points that I made, um, we want to use the, uh, the new risk equations. We just can't guess accurately, and we want some science to this. We're all uh, being held to appropriate utilization of resources. Again, it's a very easy uh, application to download and one to uh, get you know, from uh, the website. We want to make sure that in individuals who are at very high risk, we're using high-intensity statins, so just as a little sidelight. Uh, we have a paper that's under uh, review for uh, the Medicare database, patients hospitalized for clinical cardiovascular events. Um, most often, they're not getting put on a high-intensity statin. If the cardiologist gets involved, it increases the likelihood by one and a half fold, but it only made a difference on 8% of the group. You know, cardiologists weren't seeing everybody who was hospitalized for a cardiovascular event, at least not the decision maker. A lot of times it's turned over to the primary care physician. We need to follow the evidence, you know, first and foremost, and then go from uh, there. Team-based approach is important. 
And if uh, we develop the prevention program, and I'm the lead of it, this is clearly, you know, something that I've uh, implemented uh, where I've been before at Rush and, uh, you know, Northwestern with uh, great success. Adherence is really uh, key. So to uh, summarize, um, in terms of um, these issues, we have very few people that are getting uh, treated. I've reviewed this already, and now let's uh, just go to the uh, questions. Thank you. So following admission for an acute coronary syndrome, so a lot of you are involved in those individuals, I would place a patient on one of these options. Simvastatin 80 milligram daily, Pravastatin 40 milligram daily, Azetabibe 10 milligram daily, Torvastatin 80 milligram daily, or Resuvastatin 20 milligram daily. So there's five choices. And what does the evidence uh, demonstrate? Great, 61%. Uh, it's a Torvastatin miracle, a Torva 80 versus placebo, a Torvastatin 80 versus uh, Pravastatin 40 in the PROVA trial. And in stable patients, it was a Torva 80 versus 10 was superior in those uh, trials. All right. After starting a statin in a, in a patient with ACS, how long are you going to continue this high-intensity statin? For one month? For three months? For one year? Or indefinitely? 73% of you have it right. It's for the long term. And we have uh, data, again, five years and going on you know, in these uh, trials, that it's safe, it's efficacious. The number of events that occur with long-term adherence to therapy is very, very low, you know, showing maybe a 5% or 95% difference in the events over time. The longer people are in the right therapy, the greater the separation in the Kaplan-Meier uh, plots, and that's what you should be doing. Thank you very much.